Hello, friends. Um, I wanted to just talk really quickly, um, and, and in a weird way, it was because I um, got a question from someone about my opinion on something, and then I had done a reading for someone, and I thought, oh, here's an interesting question. Um, and the question was, like, is Sibylla overly negative? Um, what, what, I, <laughs> what I have found with Sibylla, weirdly, is that it does... Um, in at least the way that I've discovered it in readings, is it does seem to frequently um, identify th things that we want to be aware of that could potentially snowball. Um, and I noticed this from doing a couple forecasts, the, the six-month forecasts that I offer in my shop. Um, I've done a couple times, and even the sample readings I did, I noticed this. Uh, and then occasionally when I when I read with it outside of having a specific question, um, I noticed, and again, the interesting thing about reading, right, is that it's not just the cards, but it's the way we interpret them. Because even if you're really sticking to a system that is, you know, um, traditional, you know, you have, you, you, if you watch my videos, you know, I probably, or you probably know I have a very non-traditional, um, I mean, I, I don't think it's all that non-traditional, but I think, uh, by the standards of, of traditionalists, my Sibylla technique is, is not super traditional. Um, but I, I, um, after doing a couple of readings, I thought, is it, is it, you know, it really does seem to sort of say, if I'm not, if I'm not answering a question, um, and if I'm doing like a forecast or a more general spread, it does frequently seem to suggest negative outcomes um, and a trend that I've noticed is that the early part of a reading will often be neutral to positive, and as something goes on, I I've noticed, like, more negative, negative or short, or more shadow filters in. And it was an interesting thing, and I thought, is that me? Is it the way I read? Is it the deck? Is the deck negative? Because one of the things I look for in, in any kind of oracle deck is balance and one of the things I look f one of the reasons I like tarot so much um, is that I have come to a place and I didn't start out this way but I have come to a place where I feel like every card has light and shadow and the context determines the color you know the context determines whether it's light or shadow um, like if um, if I were to just pull three cards, if I were to just pull Temperance, for example, as a single card, um, you know, I get a sort of generic Temperance meaning. Um, if I'm doing that as like a daily draw, then I don't have much in the terms of in terms of context. Now, if I have a question, and the question is, um, what should I focus my energies on achieving today? Then that's uh, I would get sort of the light aspect of the card because it would be about being balanced, being temperate, being moderate. If the question were, what's not working in my relationship, that might be the shadow aspect of it because the relationship might be intemperate, right? The more cards that I add to the equation, the more context I get. Um, you know, so if the question is, what's not working in my relationship, and I get the Emperor, Temperance, and the Ace of Coins... Um, you know, I spend a little bit of time thinking about the images and the, the numerology, etc. Um, and I've got what's not working. I've got the emperor and temperance. Um, I've got a man and a woman who are not looking at each other. Uh, and the man is in kind of a violent pose, holding up the sort of club toward the woman. And then I have the ace. Now, aces are pretty neutral, right? Numbers are pretty neutral. Um, but in this case, I'm looking at what's not working, and I have a kind of, like, disconnected relationship. I might have a man who has a temper, I might have a woman with a drinking problem, and I have an ace. So the ace, for me, contextually, is going to be shadow, because I'm looking at a shadow reading. And so what I would say is that the, the, the practical, you know, any practical possibility for this relationship is stunted by the man's temper and the woman's drinking, for example. So tarot, I find neutral across the board, and there are oracles that are like that. I would say um, the, oh gosh, the Rackham Oracle is an example of that. 
um, maybe even the um, the shamanic medicine cards, for example. Balance balance in oracles though seems to come from keywords, right? Because they have they usually have keywords or a keyword meaning, and Sibyl is no different. So what I actually did. Um, just a minute ago was I sat down with the deck and I said, well, let me look at it. You know, how many negative and how many positive cards are there? Uh, and how many neutral cards are there? And, um, now, again, in Sibylla, you do read reversals. If you, you know, and I, though I'm not a traditionalist, I do do that. I do read reversals. Um, and so the meaning of a card can change. Um, although I tend to have a more... Um, I, I'm going to say I have a more consistent attitude toward reversals in Sibylla than the books do or traditional interpretations do because the meaning will literally change to something else. Um, I just tend to use a reversal literally as a reversal of the card. Um, so for example, if I were to get longings or size, this is the longings card in other decks, in this deck it's size, I would say um, reverse, that there's something that you're not longing for, that's, that's not wanted, that you're not overly anticipating, or that you're not yearning for, for example. But I went through and I literally counted, I sort of sorted the deck into negative, neutral, and positive. And I have to say, again, just based on the way I read them, um, it's, pretty bal it's pretty balanced, actually. Most of the deck is neutral, and then the positive and negative are fairly balanced. So in the negative pile, I just, um, and again, I did this relatively quickly, but I just did it based on the way I would interpret this as an upright card. I put haughtiness. And the other thing I'll say is depending on context, these negatives and positives could change, right? Like I put death in the negative pile, but if we're talking about something ending and it's a bad thing, then that's a positive card. Um, and if we're talking about, uh, I don't know, like pleasure seekers, for example, I put in the positive file. Um, if we're talking about like a drunken debauchery, that's negative. But just to give you a sense, in the negative pile, I put um, haughtiness, malady, jealousy, prison, thief, misfortune, enemy, melancholy. And melancholy is another one to me that actually probably belongs a little bit more in the neutral category. Falseness, sorrow, death, widower, and foe. And so out of the deck, that's only, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So there's 13. In the positive pile, in the exclusively positive pile, and again, as I said, I think these do change based on context, but fortune, love, joyfulness, wedding, pleasure seekers, gift, faithfulness, money, constancy, reunion, cheerfulness, hope frivolity, because in this is called frivolity in many decks, but in other decks it's called lightness and um, consolation. So that gives us 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So theoretically, if you follow my lead, or my, my instinct anyway, there's one more fully positive card than negative card. Um, so, and then the rest are neutral. So in that case, we have longing, wife, journey, love. And again, you could, lover rather, you could put lover in the positive pile, but lover to me is kind of neutral because it, I don't necessarily read it as a lover. Usually I, I read that as like a representative of a person. Um, soldier, messenger, surprise, priest, old woman, um, conversation, waiting, service, sweetheart, room, lord, merchant, scholar, young woman, servant, thought, letter, child, doctor, house, and friend. So, um, you know, I, by and large, it's actually neutral and balanced. So, so um, you know, that opens up an interesting question for me, which then is like, do I just read the cards negatively or, or what? Um, it's hard to know, you know what I mean? My tendency um, when I'm reading for others is more often than not to want to sort of tell them nice things. Um, but I also think it comes down to the tone of a reading. You know, Kelly from The Truth and Story, 
frequently called Sibylla Sassy. Um, and it's it's funny, you know, for for many years I've I've felt like the the diviner, not the tool, is the one who gives a reading its voice. Um, you know, and I've I've long resisted the stereotype that that Lenormand, for example, is more direct than than tarot, and uh, the journey that I've been on for the last couple of years has actually been to make tarot read as direct as I think Lenormand does. Um, and I feel like I've gotten there or gotten close. I feel like I'm capable now of answering the kinds of questions with tarot that um, the Norman readers read, and I feel like I'm able to do it um, with that level of with that level of accuracy um, or that level of specificity. But it took work to get there. But you know, it's 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 hard to deny that like decks, different decks do have different voices, I guess, and do bring out of you different things, you know? Um, I don't necessarily have seasonal decks. I don't necessarily have decks that I use for, um, uh, I, I won't necessarily use a specific deck for a romance relationship over something else. Usually when I'm reaching for a deck, it's because it's a deck that I'm just sort of enjoying looking at right now. And when I do read for others, it's frequently with a Marseille deck, honestly. It's frequently the Marshmallow or the Nublet or now the CBD. Um, although I have been sort of like super digging this weird art in the Sheridan Douglas, which sort of lives somewhere between Marseille and, and Golden Dawn. Um, so, but you know, I guess there is a connection between the art style and the deck and the the kinds of, of answers you give. And, and with Sevilla, it does seem like there's a pretty, like, blunt... Blunt isn't even the word I'm looking for. It's like... It's the... It's like the friend who says, okay, but, you know... All right, here, here's my thought, right? There are people in the world who are naturally optimists, and there are people in the world who are naturally pessimists. Um, optimists tend to love books about the power of positive thinking. Pessimists tend to resent them. Um, there's a lot that gets talked about, especially in communities like ours, about the idea of positive thinking and the power of positive thinking. And those of us who are not naturally given to positive thinking have a tendency to find positive thinking victim-blaming. Because many folks are not wired to be optimistic. Um, and there is evidence that you can train yourself to be more optimistic, but it's not set in stone that that's possible. And for me, for example, I'm not like a hugely negative person, but I'm an anxious person. And so when I walk in the room, I'm always sort of like, who hates me? Who, you know, who's going to attack me? You know, not literally, but like, where's the emergency exits? And um, the writer Barbara Ehrenreich wrote an interesting book about positive thinking. After she got diagnosed with breast cancer, she had a really strongly negative reaction to positive thinking culture, which sort of told her that if she was positive enough, her cancer would go away. Um, and it did, but it wasn't to her because of the way she thought. And, and also she felt like, if I die, is it because I wasn't thinking positive enough? And she, she coined this term, I think she coined it, and then the great writer David Rakoff talked about this later on too, called um, defensive, pep, pe um, sorry, defensive pessimism, I think is the term, which is like, you don't want to be the guy at the party telling everyone that the emergency exits are blocked. But people need someone at a party who knows where the emergency exits are. Um, and so defensive pessimism is just sort of like knowing that it's, it's like the balanced optimism where people are constantly looking on the bright side and finding the good in anything. Defensive pessimists are working hard to control their more cynical tendencies, but are also capable of knowing that, you know, sometimes bad things happen in life, and if you prepare for them, you know, you're better off. If there's a storm coming and you stock up on food and water, um, you're better off than someone who's, you know, the stereotypical eternal optimist that nothing's going to go wrong. So I guess what I'm coming to realize is that when it comes to Sibylla, um, where other 
divination forms can sometimes be neutral or optimistic, like oracles are super optimistic. Uh, I find tarot very neutral. Sibylla seems to be the defensive pessimist, who's like, yeah, things can be good, but like, here's the thing that could get in the way of the thing being good, and here's here's what's going to happen if you don't address it, you know? Um, it's an interesting thing to do, um, to do in a reading um, and sort of start with a thing of like, even these six, you know what I mean? I've got the soldier reversed, I've got the foe reversed, and I've got the lover reversed. And as I think about interpreting this as like a theme for a reading, which is sort of how I do my forecast when there's no specific question, I look at the first month as like a theme that's going to arise and then how that theme develops over the course of the following six months. Um, when I think about the soldier, I think about a person with purpose, and I think about a person with drive, and I think about a person um, who uh, may be a fighter. But again, I think about light and shadow with these cards, right? So the soldier reversed makes me think about a someone who's either purposeless or someone who's kind of reckless, or someone who fights without cause. And then I've got the foe reversed, so I've got someone who isn't necessarily... Um, a uh, a friend they're not necessarily an enemy either but they don't have your best interest at heart and then i've got the lover reversed so you know someone who's not really um feeling it right now so i've i've got a picture of a person right now who's sort of um in a state of being on the verge you know um or even being in the midst of of being rootless um antagonistic belligerent um, who, who's suppressing a need to betray and who doesn't have a lot of um, affection that they're, they're putting out into the world. Um, you know, so it's like, here's, here's who you are right now. Um, and then the forecast, you know, so even this little sample reading doesn't start with like a super great picture. Now that could be a situation, it could be an event. Again, context helps, but um, you know, I, I feel like and, and it may not even be the voice of Sibylla, but I feel like Sibylla seems to be so far really good at, like, um, here's the thing you have to look out for. Um, you know, sure, everything can be good, but here's the here's the thing that's going to make it not be good if you're not careful. Um, you know, and then I interpret the rest of the months uh, when I do this forecast. So it's like, here's the first month which tells me what situation in that month is going to happen. So if I were doing a forecast, I would probably start with February. Um, so I would say in February, you know what I mean, there's going to be this energy around um, a sense of rootlessness and not having something to fight for, um, and you feel like you're betraying your deepest emotions, right? So I, I would, you know, I made that up now. It's a slightly different interpretation from looking at it at the first three, but I'm just exploring. Um, so I have three people in this row. I'm saying this is going to describe the person I'm reading for, um, because there are three titles of people. Like, this is a person, but it's, it's longing. Um, you know, so, so you're feeling rootless, you're feeling like you don't have a cause to fight for, uh, and you're betraying your better nature because of that. Um, so as that manifests in February, if you don't address that right now, you're going to find yourself in a state of longing to be separated um, from fortune, if I look at it just sort of as like keywords to start, and then I interpret it as what that means. So there's going to be this desire for some reason for you to like separate yourself, to divorce yourself, to, to widow yourself from things that are good for you, you know, your fortune, your, your, um, your, your, better, your better nature. Um, so if you don't kind of address the sense of rootlessness, you're going to start finding yourself wanting to like, to, to end things that have been very fortunate for you. Um, and then as we go into the next month, I, I say, okay, we here we have messenger, enemy reversed, melancholy reversed, you know, and I, I keep going. So it seems like when I do this forecast without a question, I guess what I'm getting to, as I keep saying over and over again, is that Sibylla isn't necessarily negative, but it seems to be the friend who's like, okay, I'm going to cut to the problem, and I'm going to tell you what happens if you don't address the problem. Now, if I were looking at this in a different way, and I were answering a question about a romance, and I were doing it as a nine-card reading, I would look at it differently. You know what I mean? I would say, actually, there's the potential that the relationship isn't going to work out because you're very belligerent about what you want for. And you, you know, so I start looking at the rows and the columns, and I say, you're belligerent, you're, you're demanding, you're not 
fighting for what's right. You're sort of demanding that what you want should be what gets delivered to you, you know, and that's a very different feeling. But again, it's sort of like going to the core of what's a problem. So, um, but that doesn't bug me much, honestly, because I feel like there's a, um, and just an interesting thing in the idea of having a tool that's really good at getting to the root of, of, um, problems as a problem solving tool. You can't solve the problem until you know what it is. So, um, you know, I've only, I've only been working with this tool for about, gosh, when did I start looking at this in September? So six months, uh, no, not even six months, um, four or five, you know what I mean? And maybe slightly longer than that. I don't remember. It doesn't matter. Anyway, I did find sort of a simpatico with it, with it right away, uh, and I've had really good readings with it. But um, the readings that I've given have been very like, doink, here's the thing you need to watch out for. Um, and here's what happens if you don't. And so it's interesting, you know, and it's, it's helpful. And that's not to say that Tarot doesn't do that. Um, but um, I would say in a weird way, like this seems to be less neutral, you know what I mean? It's, it's gonna, it's gonna go to the jugular of like, what's the thing that's getting in the way? Um, I don't know why. And it may just be me. It's interesting. Anyway, so I just wanted to put this out there and sort of talk about the idea of whether Sibylla is negative because I got a question about it and I did a reading and it made me wonder. And I've also heard people say, well, Sibylla's more negative. Um, but card wise, it's actually, you know, you've got like 13 sort of straight up negative cards, 13 or 14 straight up positive cards, and then 25 or so that fall into what's generally pretty neutral. So it, it's not, it's not the deck. It's the way the car combination of cards come out. And for some reason, the reason that fi the way that these fire together in my brain seems to like connect to this thing of like, here's the thing, here's the thing you got to look out for. Um, and that's not always, but it just seems to be a trend I've noticed, so I wanted to share it. So just putting that out there, I thought it would be an interesting thing for folks who are considering looking at Sibylla as a tool. I really, really do like it. I like it a lot. Um, this is not my favorite deck of Sibylla cards, as I have mentioned before, but it is the one I use the most often um, because it helps me connect the picture to the English word. Although, as you've seen, I've already started remembering the names another deck so it may be time for me to go back to looking at it um at the everyday oracle or the uh sibylla original from il Menegilla. but that's it so anyway there's just a little musing on this that i it was on my head and my mind and i thought i would share it um so again i don't think it's negative i think the deck itself is pretty balanced um but it does seem at least when i read to sort of like identify the like the chink in the armor or the, the the problem that can occur, especially if you don't ask a specific question. So hope that's interesting. Be good.